uh, I'm Tracy Miranda, and I'll be talking to you today about unlocking high performing teams with open source. And I think um, everyone who's here today is just looking to up level um, their game when it comes to delivering software and using open source. And you know, if you're looking for kind of best practices or some advice, um, I'm just happy to share um, what what I've been learning and more about um, the Continuous Delivery Foundation, which I help um, run. So let's start with some introductions. So a little bit about me for those of you who don't know me. Um, just about last month, I took on the role of the Executive Director at the Continuous Delivery Foundation, which is an open source foundation. And I'll, I'll be talking a bit more about um, what I'm, I'm doing in that capacity. And before that, I was the director of open source software at Cloudbees, which meant in practice that I got to work very, very closely with the awesome open source communities for the Jenkins and Jenkins X project. And um, before that, I was also involved in open source with the Eclipse Foundation. So throughout that community, including a spell on, on the board of directors. So all in all, I think what I'm trying to say is um, I'm pretty much a veteran in, in open source communities. I, and there's good reason for that. I, I really love it. And so huge evangelist um, for everything that open source communities have to offer and also want to see them get better and better and include um, some more folks. So if you want to reach out to me, you can find me on LinkedIn or um, at Tracy Miranda on Twitter. And I also have a, a blog where I write about um, careers in tech and you know, just how to make sense of that uh, in today's day and age. But what I will be talking to you today about is um, what does it mean to be a high performing team? And then um, building on from that, you know, knowing what that means, how do we go about um, improving our teams? Uh, how do we leverage what's out there today? And most importantly, what role does open source have to play uh, in, in us becoming better, better teams together? So let's get started. And as I mentioned, I will be keeping an eye on the chat. Um, so feel free to distract me with questions um, or conversation things and yeah, I'm happy to uh, build on that as we go. Great, so I just realized. Okay, can folks see the slide that says, how does it mean, what does it mean to be a high performing team? Just making sure I'm updating the right slides. Yes, thank you. Great. Okay, so when it comes to being a high performing team, um, we have a very specific definition of this today. And this comes from um, the awesome research that was done from the folks from Dora. And what they did was they effectively broke it down into um, these four metrics on what you, what teams that are considered high performing, or we've even got to a point where we can talk about elite teams do better than the rest. And these metrics, um, as you see, how frequently do you deploy code? What is your lead time from the moment you push the code to when it gets deployed? Um, those first two are focused on speed. And then the other two are um, you know, delivering things safely. So how long does it take you to recover if something goes wrong? And you know, what is the frequency or the change failure rate of um, when you push, how often does that go wrong? So the incredible thing about um, these metrics is that they found um, in, in this research that the teams that were doing it, you know, were significantly better um, than teams that want. And you know, particularly if you look at the lead time from commit to deploy, um, you know, that's a 2000 times faster, you know, we, we have these things where we talk about 10x developers and things like that. And that's all kind of made up BS. But here we have real numbers that are talking about how you can and your team can be you know, 2000 times faster 
um, that then other folks just by kind of following this plan they, they laid out. And before I get into that a bit more, um, here's uh, kind of the reference. There's the, the state of DevOps report, which uh, also the most recent one is back from 2019. And uh, what you also have is um, the awesome Accelerate book, which accompanies those reports. And it really kind of gives a breakdown of the research as well as how you can go about achieving those metrics. So this talk, I'm not going to talk about like how you would measure those metrics. There's lots of awesome folks who, who have done that. And there was a talk at um, CDCon last week. I can drop in the link about uh, someone from Google talking about how you could go about measuring that. I'm not going to cover that. Um, but what I will say um, in the book, I love this quote from Nicole Forsgren, one of the authors, where she says, uh, software delivery is an exercise in continuous improvement. And our research shows that year over year, the best keep getting better and those who fail to improve fall further and further behind. So I think with that point, what I want to emphasize is, you know, so we have these four metrics, we know that's what it means to be a high performing team, but we also know that it does feel a bit like you're on a treadmill because um, there's all these people who are getting better at doing um, at these metrics. And then if you're standing still, or you know, holding on to kind of the way things were done that don't help you get better, then you're you're, you're just falling further and further behind, even if you think you know you're just in one place. So, what do you need to do to actually um, get better and to become that high-performing team? So, the answers are actually pretty much laid out in the Accelerate book, and so it's an awesome book. It is. Kind of the defining software book of our time. I highly recommend people read it, but if you aren't going to get around to reading it, I'm going to summarize um, the capabilities on this slide. So the book outlines um, 24 capabilities which drive improvement, and they divide them up into different categories. And what you'll see on, on the left in this diagram is that one third of those capabilities are all grouped in this set of practices that are referred to as continuous delivery capabilities. And so that is like continuous delivery is, is kind of where I'm coming in from. And that's kind of the high level things we want to focus on. So some of the other um, capabilities you'll see, they fall under architecture or product and processes or lean management. And then there's also things on leadership, which are covered in the, the kind of cultural capabilities. So it isn't just, you know, there's no kind of silver bullet. There's not just this one thing you have to do or this one great trick. It's actually getting a lot of these things done well and done well together. And this is where I'll, I'll kind of go into a bit more. So, um, before I get into more on, on kind of continuous delivery and tying it into open source, I just want to talk a little about um, some terms, which, especially if you're new to the whole space, they tend to be used a bit interchangeably and um, often quite confusingly. And I know for the benefit of any folks who are kind of new um, to the whole DevOps or CICD, I just want to spend kind of a minute talking about some high level differences. So you'll often see the terms um, agile and CICD and DevOps kind of used in, in, in kind of different ways with different meaning. But there is a, a, a lot of overlap in them. Um, but each one kind of has its own history and each one tends to highlight a slightly different um, have emphasis on a slightly different area. Sorry, I just noticed this slide is missing. There's a reference to a document where this is from, a blog post. Um, so I will, when I share the slides, I'll, I'll make sure that's there. I don't know where that's disappeared to. But the one thing I want to say is, um, so while I, Agile focuses um, a lot on kind of processes and you have DevOps will often lead with culture and what you do need to do on the people side. Um, when it comes to CICD or as I prefer to call it, just continuous delivery, 
um, as an umbrella of practices that is really focused on, on kind of the tooling side of things. So it doesn't happen in isolation, but there's a lot more emphasis on, you know, how do you go about automating things and how do you go about delivering software and what are the tool, tools you need to do to do that. Um, and then if we have to talk about continuous delivery, um, just specifically, uh, and to just give a very kind of simplified definition, um, it's, you know, a practice where teams want to keep uh, their software ready to be delivered at any time. It typically involves uh, kind of a continuous cycle where you're coding, building, testing, and deploying. And typically I'd see continuous integration as part of that. So that would be one step where the teams can commit um, repeatedly and those changes are integrated into the main line um, or the trunk uh, in, in a regular fashion, which is you know, the evolution from once upon a time where we people would just save their software um, and develop in silos and then bring it all together all at once and then just have enormous pain trying to put that together. So we kind of know what continuous delivery is. It's, it's pretty well um, set out what some of the practices are. We have the Accelerate book, which spells it out. And the other part of the puzzle is, is kind of the benefits. And again, going back to Accelerate, they really paint a picture of the benefits you can have by implementing continuous delivery practices. So, like if you had to imagine what your organization would look like implementing these practices, you, you'd need to picture an organization that delivers uh, new features faster than its competition. Or you might be picturing an organization that takes advantage of fast feedback from its, um, its customers or its clients to really build a very deep relationship with them so they can respond to anything that they're seeing or, or they, they're bringing up. Or you might picture an organization that can pivot very, very quickly to changes uh, in the industry or in fact, changes in the world as we've seen with um, the, the pandemic. So there's all sorts of benefits that you know, the research really spells out um, make a big difference. And there's one in addition to all of those that I think is, is probably kind of more important um, than all those other benefits. And that's kind of the benefit it means for individuals as well. And this is all to do with, with burnout. And so we have this, we also know that if you kind of automate the software delivery, then the teams who are involved with that are less likely to, to be burnt out. And the more investment you make in implementing uh, automation in this area, the better it is ultimately for your team. So I think beside this combination of kind of the benefits for the business, but really the benefits um, for the individual as well, especially, you know, I don't know how you're finding things at the moment, but, you know, I know from personal experience, things are pretty hard right now. There's lots of craziness in this world. And the least we can kind of ask from our organization is that, you know, we're not having to stress out um, about things which we can kind of get under control and get, get automated in a way that, that just keeps the stress away. So knowing these benefits and knowing um, how we get there, like there's a big question of, okay, why aren't we just all doing that? You know, why haven't we already adopted all these things? Why haven't we taken advantage of all this kind of amazing stuff? And I think this comes down to um, three key reasons. And the first reason, um, is related to kind of this shift we've had in the industry where we've sort of worked out that to, to kind of better implement these practices, it makes more sense to move away from monolithic code bases um, and to divide it, things up into more microservices. And then on top of that, we've got this whole set of technologies um, which make it better to work in distributed environments and it really takes full advantage of, of the cloud. So we have cloud native technologies, things like Kubernetes and that whole ecosystem um, really give us huge, huge benefits when it comes to, you know, particularly scaling and being able to kind of ramp up uh, or down. 
but um, with those changes, it does mean there's a proliferation of environments. So now we're having to deliver to more environments. In general, we have to contend with things like containers and we have to change um, some of the fundamental ways we have of working. And the second thing um, with these changes, that's also res resulted in a very, very fragmented um, tool landscape. So you'll find there's lots of new tooling coming around trying to take advantage of containers and microservices and cloud native technology. Um, but it, they don't, the tools don't necessarily work well together and it's not necessarily clear what each tool does, partly because we aren't necessarily clear about what we mean by different terms in the industry and people will kind of use the same terms to mean lots of different things. So that's an additional challenge. And then uh, finally, the third thing is um, simply that change is hard. And I love that Michael Wolf has put that all in caps in the chat because change is hard. Um, there's a limit, it feels, to how much an organization or an individual can be asked to do and to change in a short space of time, um, especially like if you don't have a good reason why that's happening. That being said, um, in this time with COVID and the pandemic, we have all pushed ourselves to the max. We've all learned to kind of wash our hands as if we're going into surgery. We've learned how to not touch our faces. We've learned how to wear a mask. Well, most of us have learned how to do that, not everybody, but uh, I'm gonna guess most people here have. And I think what makes the difference is that we know when it's important and we know when it matters. Um, and then we can kind of do these incredible things and we can change, not just as individuals, but as an ecosystem or as a community, as people. So these kind of reasons, um, were this real strong motivation for kind of a new open source community um, that came to life uh, in March 2019. And this is the Continuous Delivery Foundation. And it was formed um, as the home of some key open source projects. Uh, so you may all have heard of this project called Jenkins. Uh, and then it's cloud native counterpart Jenkins X, Spinnaker, the incredible technology that Netflix uses to deliver software and Tekton, which came out of Google and the Knative uh, serverless platform. So the idea here was not just to house these open source projects and help them to be more sustainable, but also to help um, create an ecosystem where we could all come together and kind of figure out how to take advantage of kind of modern software delivery um, and just appreciate, you know, that all our businesses are becoming driven by software. Um, but when it comes to change, this is super hard and unless we're doing it as a community, it just continues to be really, really challenging. So when CDF first started, um, you know, we sort of saw that community as a home for this next set of continuous delivery collaboration and set of tools. And we, we sort of started off down that path and you know, got together with a lot of the key folks from the projects, as well as some folks from the industry, uh, Jane Grohl from the DevOps Institute and Jess Humble, uh, who, who was one of the co-authors of Accelerate. We we're happy to come in and advise um, and just help us kind of find our way and our direction. And I think we're getting um, to a, a better place where we're looking at the Continuous Delivery Foundation as uh, our ultimate mission is to help improve the world's capacity to deliver software with security and speed. And um, so I think this comes down to, you know, what can we do to help people get better at being high performing in terms of those metrics around security and speed? And how do we do that and come together as an open source community and help each other? So what I'm going to spend a little bit of time is just talking about a few ways that we're doing that and how that means you can take advantage of open source uh, in, in a more effective way. Um, okay, I'm distracted by the comments. So I'm just seeing that the creating the conditions for change is also hard comment from Craig Cook. And um, yeah, I really love that because um, 
and just to, to diverge for a minute. Um, when, if you've ever been in a position where you're trying to convince people to do something differently, and I've done that a lot with open source, um, you know, there's a number of things that, that really make a difference. And some of that is, you know, about being persistent and uh, championing things. And other things is about, like you said, the conditions for change. And sometimes that condition is, what is the rest of the industry doing? What is the environment you're existing in? Um, so I think this kind of plays into it of saying, how do we help people understand continuous delivery is super important? How do we help them understand um, how to approach it today, that things have changed and what you were doing 10 years ago, um, where you may have thought you had your whole delivery flow sorted because everyone's been delivering software forever. That was good. So why does it matter? Why do things have to change um, in this new world? And I, th I think this, this all kind of comes together um, to, to these topics I'm, I'm talking about. So it's super important and we want to drive for adoption and we want to help people do that. So one of the things I'm going to highlight um, that we're starting to try and figure out is um, the, the whole landscape. So I talked about a kind of fragmented landscape before and um, the Continuous Delivery Foundation is putting together its own kind of landscape of the tools needed um, to, for a continuous delivery solution. So we've taken inspiration from um, the cloud native. So the CNCF have their landscape, um, sometimes affectionately called Healthscape because it's grown to kind of be this all encompassing set of projects, which is, you know, helps give you sort of a, a scale, sense of scale of the problem. But here we're zooming in on the different things that help contribute to its continuous delivery. This is still a kind of version 0.1 but the important thing to note is kind of setting out the different categories of tools, you know, what are the different things um, and types of things you'll need. It's not just CI, CD. I hate that term because people think, okay, you do some CI, uh, continuous integration, and then you do some continuous delivery or deployment, and then you're done. You know, you've delivered software, well done, um, pat yourself on the back. But really, there's a whole set of things that come together, and um, the forgotten cousins tend to be security and testing. Um, so those need to kind of play play a bigger role in, in continuous delivery. And you will notice that there isn't a category on here that is a specific kind of continuous delivery category. Um, I think there's a bit of misnomer in the industry. So pipeline orchestration is what uh, people mean when they, they say continuous delivery tools, but really continuous delivery is the entire practice. Um, so all of these tools help towards that practice. So it includes, um, you know, that list from Accelerate and it includes testing and it includes continuous integration and it includes version control. So um, this landscape is that start of trying to give people that realistic picture of what you need to do. And then maybe a few pointers to some of the tooling in the area that can help you. And then also breaking that up into thinking about it in either cloud native or kind of traditional um, sense. And this is totally open source. So if you want to add a tool or add a contribution or help us evolve it, um, I encourage you to keep to get involved. Okay, so the second um, thing is around um, open source projects in this space. So as I mentioned, um, CDF uh, started with some four incredible projects, uh, Jenkins, Spinnaker, Tekton, and Jenkins X. Um, and then after, I think last year, we accepted our first um, other project, which is Screwdriver. Um, but when we talk about these projects, uh, one thing to note is that we have these projects and they're at different ends of the adoption lifecycle. So you've got projects like Jenkins and Spinnaker and lots of folks are using that. You know, Jenkins much more than anything else. And you know, everybody's heard of it. Everybody's got some sort of automation running in Jenkins. And then Spinnaker is also being increasingly used at different enterprises. But then at the other end of the spectrum, you have um, kind of Jenkins X and Tekton, which are both these cloud native technologies. And they are really kind of being used by the early adopters and the innovators, people who have just started to um, adopt Kubernetes and now are trying to figure out, okay, what does, 
what do the pipelines look like? How do I pull that together? How do I really take advantage of this incredible scaling um, that comes with these platform? And those are still kind of in very early stages. They're part of a very fast changing um, kind of industry and, and environment. So th there's a lot that prevents them today from you know, having wider adoption, but it's something we should see more and more. So um, before I go more into some on Jenkins X and Tecton, what a, um, I do want to hop back to uh, Accelerate and the State of DevOps report to say that again, um, one of the things we see high performers do is leverage open source software. And the data in that report talks about kind of this elite performers level, which is kind of the highest level they leverage and plan to expand use of open source software. And in general, elite performers are much more likely to make extensive use of open source software and to be expanding the use of open source software. And a couple of reasons um, this comes down to, and which I'll, I'll sort of spell out with um, some specific examples from the projects. But on the one hand, um, it is about, um, you know, when you adopt open source and especially if you stay on kind of more cutting edge projects and you're able to, to kind of adopt things coming out, it means you're always dealing with your technical debt. And then the other thing is, you know, you, you get to take advantage of uh, typically a, a community that's growing and changing. So you, you get to take advantage of learning and in a very short space of time, uh, what's happening there. So this is kind of, those are my add-ons, um, which I'll kind of go into more details, but at a very high level, we know kind of high performance leverage open source software. And um, yeah, I have a few theories as, as to why that is true. So going back to, um, you know, the, how do we get better at delivering software securely and at seed? We have this whole list of 24 things. And then the question I want you to ask yourself is, for the things on this list, which of those um, are things that you have to change about the culture and your team? And which of those you are things that you can actually get tooling to help you? Um, so can tools help? That's my quick question. And um, to answer that myself, I will say yes. And I think there are some specific areas where tooling um, simplifies or certainly opinionated tooling can put you down a, a better path, um, especially if they, the tooling was built with these things in mind from the beginning. And to give a more specific example of that, um, so the Jenkins X project um, is a project that was written in an era since Accelerate book was written. And the, the folks who wrote that, um, James Strachan and James Rowling, um, I think I, I know are big fans of the Accelerate book. And so they were looking to see which of those capabilities um, can be encapsulated in a tool to, to a certain extent. So it makes life easier. Um, and you know, on the left, on the right, on the right, we've got um, kind of seven capabilities there. And there's a blog post there which talks specifically about how um, Jenkins X is designed to make these practices kind of de facto. So by using um, tools like this, you know, it supports being able to version control all of the artifacts um, through things like GitOps, and it supports ways to fully automate your deployment purposes. And I will go into each of these, but I do encourage you to take a look at that blog post. Um, and, and it's through leveraging um, some of these things that you fully start to be able to take advantage of the, the new cloud native technologies. So um, you can have this true automation um, and you can have everything kind of tracked in version control through, through GitOps. Uh, when we talk about scaling uh, in practice, what does scaling mean? Scaling means, well, you know, you can go ahead and build every pull request and into a preview environment. So you can look at what that looks like before um, you kind of approve the code or merge it. So everything is kind of shifting left to happen much earlier in the cycle. 
and you can have things like uh, chat ops integration. So, you know, modern continuous delivery kind of looks a lot different than than what we've had in the past, and it really is about taking advantage of all these different features. So this is kind of one of the things when we talk about, um, you know, being better high performing by taking advantage of the, the latest tooling. Uh, it's projects like Jenkins X, which um, help with that. And one of the ways it does it surprisingly enough or not is that Jenkins X leverages other open source projects. Um, so in the same way in our companies and in our organizations, we should be looking at what's out there and um, using open source projects. Jenkins X does that by pulling together um, all kind of tools in this space and making them work well together. So this ties um, back to the Continuous Delivery Foundation. One of our aims is to foster greater tool interoperability. And um, a lot of that at the moment looks like um, trying to leverage the Tecton project so Tecton is a set of building blocks, um, which Jenkins X actually uses uh, to build on top of Kubernetes, um, the CI CD pipelines. So there's this awesome toilet analogy where Jenkins X is the porcelain and Tecton is the plumbing. And I won't say what that means about what is being delivered, uh, but you can figure that out for yourselves. But yeah, Tecton is just this incredible project um, which again, it goes back to, you know, if you're familiar with open source, you've seen it time and time again, instead of reinventing the wheel, can we just um, offer these standardized building blocks? So Tecton is for engineers who are building CI CD systems and they want them to be scal scalable and serverless and cloud native. And we wanna, you know, encourage folks to use that instead of um, writing things from scratch again, writing their own some resource definitions in Kubernetes. And um, so it's not just Jenkins X that uses it. We know um, like the Knative project from Google are using it. Um, IBM and Red Hat are using it. Uh, Puppet's using it as, as their basis for, for their relay project. Um, I just saw a lovely project from eBay where they are kind of rewriting uh, things in microservices and they're leveraging Tecton. So I think this is another way open source really makes a big difference to the industry where if we can all kind of agree to use shared building blocks and to have them more portable and interoperable, then um, we can really kind of get to the next stage of where we're innovating and we're not just reinventing the wheel over and over again. Um, so in general, uh, we have a set of like-minded folks in CDF who are all about driving for common APIs and metadata and trying to figure out, you know, can we provide these standardized building blocks um, for shared AP APIs? And that comes in the form of the Interoperability Special Interest Group, uh, which is a community-driven initiative set up by folks from the community and is open for anyone to join. So you can check out the GitHub page. Um, and it's a super great group um, doing some really good work. One of the first things they sort of worked out is that everybody was using the same terms for, for different things. So we had to just start out by establishing this kind of shared vocabulary, which we call the, the Rosetta Stone uh, for CICD. So just understanding why different projects, what the different terms are and whether they are the same or different, uh, not just in um, pipeline orchestration tools, but also kind of version control tools. And again, that's something open that you can contribute uh, your own tools or terminology to and, and kind of be part of that conversation. Okay, so um, from there, um, I really want to kind of encourage you to um, get involved with the various things we have at the Continuous Delivery Foundation. There are a whole bunch of other things, um, but I, I think I want to focus on the areas where we think um, not only help teams uh, to get better at being high performing, but also if we take this wider view of the industry and scale up, we say, you know, how can we be more effective as communities in, in kind of using what's out there and working together and helping people get better? And I'm going to just wrap it up with uh, a few concluding thoughts. 
and then see if we've got any questions anything from the audience. So to conclude, um, you know, I think when it comes to high performing teams, we all want to get there. Accelerate tells us how to do that. And um, what our challenge is, is to figure out which of those can we kind of leverage open source tools to do and get better at and which of those, you know, and then free ourselves up to work on the really hard things of changing people and changing cultures. And if I had to summarize kind of what I want you to take away from this talk um, is that we, we know what it means to be a high performing team. Uh, it's kind of spelled out in, in the metrics and Accelerate book gives us the high level steps to unlock this high, high performance. And as we see continuous delivery practices are key to that. So about a third of the, of the things you wanna do fall under this umbrella of continuous delivery practices. That being said, uh, what you think you might know has changed with microservices and cloud native technology have changed the game for all of us. So in, in many ways, we're all kind of trying to figure it out again in this distributed environment. Uh, change is, is pretty challenging, but once again, open source um, can come to the rescue there. So uh, you can look at adopting open source technologies like Jenkins X and Tekton to make the most of what modern software delivery has to offer. And then the other side of that is just by joining open source communities, um, it will really help make your continuous improvement journey easier. Uh, if you want to create that environment to help bring about change or get support from other people in the same boat, um, we're doing a lot of that at, at the Continuous Delivery Foundation. So, um, I'll finish with a plug to say, you know, just get involved with our community, either with specific projects or the interoperability group. We also have an end user council for folks who are trying to figure out things around, you know, compliance and governance and developer experience. Um, so just reach out to me and happy to give you some pointers. Uh, we just had our first CDCon kind of last uh, two weeks ago. And these are kind of some of the selfies. So um, they, they are lots of great people who are part of the community and are happy to come together and work together. And finally, if I kind of had to summarize um, what we're all trying to do is we're trying to get better at doing continuous delivery. We're trying to leverage open source and everything that open source stands for, the transparency, the collaboration, the innovation. Um, we're really driving to have a, a much more kind of diverse community, which is open to kind of the next generation of folks who are contributing. And I think if you put those all together, um, you know, that's really where I see CDF being and the direction we'll, we'll be going in open source. So uh, finally, um, good luck with your journeys and becoming high performing team. And yeah, I welcome you to join uh, the Continuous Delivery Foundation and uh, just help let us help you in, in that journey to getting there. Okay, so um, I'm going to leave it there and see if I can find the questions. Does anybody have any questions? Okay, I don't see any questions in the Q&A, so I'm like, oh, so that's really nice feedback. Thank you, Michael. All and right, well, I will drop, um, I will just go and save the link to the slides in here, actually, so if folks want, I'm sure there'll be a way to find them, but you can start with this. Great, that, that would be awesome. Thanks for uh, sending that. And Tracy, thank you for a great presentation, really super informative, and thank you all for joining us. We still have about five minutes left in this session, so if you have any questions for Tracy, please feel free to send them. Uh, via the chat function or the Q&A function in Zoom. Uh, while we wait for some uh, questions maybe coming in, I would like you all to uh, please uh, look forward to DevOps Day's Raleigh event if you enjoyed this presentation and other ones like this. Uh, it's happening April 8th at the McKinnon Center in Raleigh. And for more information, I'll send a, a link over in chat for more information. Um, so yeah, if you have any questions, please send it over uh, to Tracy while we still have her for the next couple of minutes. 
And once it's about five minutes has passed, we'll be prepping for our final presentation for today, which is best practices in implementing container image promotion pipelines by Baruch Sadagoruski. So thanks for joining us. And yeah, please send over some questions if you have any. I see Michael says, I have a question. I am currently working on an embedded real-time system that operates off the network. I can't use some of the technology, but what kinds of practices can I use? Uh, no problem. Okay, so um, I'm guessing, and just drop in the chat if you're saying, if you're saying you can't use some of the technologies, I'm guessing because this is not um, strictly cloud native. Um, but I think you can like, Am I still sharing? I think I'm still sharing the screen. I'm thinking about delivering small changes, no big bang delivery. Yeah, I think like if you look at the capabilities and you know, probably one of the most controversial ones on there is number four, which is about trunk based development. And it's really about, you, you know, doing these small changes. So is that something um, in there? Are you trying to switch folks from big bang to actually doing small changes in, in a more focused way where you don't have long lived branches. I'm gonna wait for you to answer that. Um, yeah, one, two year delivery cycles. Okay, yeah, I think just helping your organization understand that that doesn't work uh, in today's world. And I'm pretty sure there's, even in the embedded space I used to work in in that area, they are folks who are getting better and better and that you know software delivery is gonna be the differentiator. Um, so one of the things about the research was that it, like the, the, it didn't matter which industry, they were people, high performers in different industries. So I think you will find that as much as some organizations like to make out that it's all about the industry, um, it's not the case. Um, so these practices can be applied regardless of what industry and they can to some extent be applied regardless of um, what like programming languages. Uh, I know folks who use COBOL who will you know deliver twice a week or even more frequently and um, I think it is a, all about kind of just getting the team set up and well really meeting all these requirements on there. I Given regulatory beliefs, they do not see that it can be done like this. Um, microservices. Okay. Yeah, so I think um, this is a great point about, like, I love how you put beliefs in quotes, because I think one thing we want to get better at, uh, especially as if you're bringing about change, is, is kind of debunking what are the myths um, in organization and what is the reality? So like people will often put up these barriers which are kind of pretty sort of set in stone. Many people believe them, but they aren't necessarily true. And I think this is where community helps as well. Um, we do have an end user council where we get together and people compare notes on what it actually means. And we, you know, we have some folks from regulated industries. So I think this is, that tends to be a good way as well of knowing, you know, what is the reality of industries? Um, most of them, like I think they are some key ones where it is a, a blocker for some things, but in, in many cases, uh, it's not the case. Let me drop a link to our end user council. And if that's something, um, there's a way to get in touch if you wanna join it. And then I think my best recommendation is find folks in your industry who are doing things um, in in kind of a, a more high performance way and kind of leverage that to take it back to your organization to kind of beat them over the head with it because I'm gonna guess half the things you that are being set up as barriers are just not realistic barriers. 